Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Mike McBride. I'm a professor of economics at the University of California, Irvine. And uh, first, I'd like to thank the uh, Sabre organizers for a great conference and also for their flexibility and accommodating those of us whose employers did not let us travel to Phoenix this weekend. So I'm happy to talk about this uh, new project. So it starts with a, an important distinction in Sabre metrics. So we have uh, measures that are intentionally designed to accurately measure skill. And to do that, it's important to separate the player's talent from context and, and we wanna predict future performance. The idea, being that, the idea being that there's a true talent that's unobserved. And so it needs to be estimated from noisy data. And so we have lots of measures of this uh, from OPS, DRC+, WOBA, XWOBA, and so on. But there are also other measures of importance in baseball history that are better called credit measures. And a credit measure to be a good one needs to accurately reflect the collaborative nature of scoring and distribute the credit for any scoring or wins that happen uh, in a fair way. And so this is not estimation, this is accounting. And it's a part of the storytelling of what happens in a game. And some credit measures include runs, RBIs, win probability added, and earned runs. And most of the recent advances in Sabre metrics recently have been in estimating skill ever uh, more and more precisely. Um, but uh, there have been fewer advances in improving the accuracy of assigning credit. And so in my project, I take a concept from coalitional game theory called the Shapley value to create two new measures of credit. And to my knowledge, it's the first application of the Shapley value uh, in Sabre metrics. Uh, one measure I call Shapley run credits, SRC, and this takes uh, any given run that's scored and distributes the credit for that run to the different players who deserve credit for that run. There's also an, a second measure called offensive Shapley win credits, which is a win credit measure that allocates credit among the offensive players who contributed to the team outscoring the opponent in that game. So what are these good for? Well, first and foremost, it's uh, for improved accounting of, of runs and wins in games. And uh, the idea is that this is a, a, a credit, these are credit measures that have very strong theoretical grounding in game theory. They're very easy to use. And I would argue that they're the best holistic credit measures we have available uh, and that they could be included and should be included in something like a box score. And uh, these measures should be of interest to a wide audience. Uh, fans uh, can appreciate these measures. It helps them to understand what happens in a game or a series or a season. Uh, one particular application is in uh, using these measures to help select uh, the MVP uh, in a series or a season. And I'll uh, use that, that application later in my talk. Um, but they can also be compared with other skill measures to get an estimate of how much teammate quality impacts the actual run contribution of player makes during a season. So this all begins with the Shapley value. So it's named after Lloyd Shapley, uh, who was the 2012 uh, Nobel Prize co-winner uh, in uh, economics. Uh, and he got credit, he, his, this award, the Nobel Prize, was largely for his work in coalitional game theory, in particular, the Shapley value. The Shapley value calculates a fair allocation of credit for a person for their contribution towards a team. And in specifically, it calculates the average marginal contribution to team production across all possible coalition permutations, all possible ways the team can be constructed. And the Shapley value is very uh, important because it has these interesting and, and valid uh, theoretical properties. One, it's efficient. It takes the full value of the team output and allocates it among the players. It does so in a way so that if any two players make the same impact, they have the same credit. It's anonymous in that only the contributions matter and it's unique. So we have one uh, unique measure. And it's also the case that this is uh, th these properties make it valuable for lots of different settings. So it's widely used in economics, it's used in the law, it's used in public finance. So it's a very, very uh, significant and influential um, concept. So let me demonstrate how we can calculate uh, uh, SRC. Um, so here's a simple four uh, play event inning. So Aaron, say Hank Aaron hits a double, Barry Bonds hits a sacrifice bunt to get him to third, Rod Crew sacrifice flies him home, and then Joe DiMaggio uh, strikes out for the third out in the inning. So one run scores in this inning. To calculate the Shapley run credit, we need a bunch of information as we see in this table. So the first thing is this column on the left. This is the list of all the ordered permutations, which is an abstract uh, list 
uh, it's a list of uh, uh, all the possible ways we could construct the four play events in that inning, the, but with the four players. And so in uh, number, number one, permutation one, we construct this coalition by first adding Aaron, then Bonds, then Crew, then DiMaggio. In order two, we add Aaron, then Bonds, then DiMaggio, then Crew, and so on all the way down to the 24th permutation, which is DiMaggio, Crew, then Bonds, then Aaron. Now, I'll show you what it means to add them in these orders in just a second. Um, so let's first look at uh, the first order perm permutation. And we're trying to calculate uh, Aaron's uh, SRC here. So in column B, we have what the coalition is before we add Aaron. Well, he's added first. So there is uh, nobody in this coalition. You can see my cursor. Uh, and if you have no play events in an inning, well, that produces no runs. So the runs produced from this pre-Aaron coalition are zero. But if we add Aaron to it, well, we're adding a double to an inning, but an inning with just a double doesn't produce any runs either. So the marginal addition of Aaron in this ordering is zero, and that's the zero in the far right column. That's going to work the same for all of the permutations in which Aaron is added first. His marginal contribution will be zero. What about if we add Aaron after Bonds? Well, if we add Bonds first, we have an inning with just a, a bunt out. Well, that doesn't score a run. And if we put a double in front of it, here, when we add Aaron, we put him in proper sequence in the batting order. When we add Aaron, so we have a double. Well, that still doesn't score a run. It just results in a runner on third with one out. So the marginal contribution of Aaron in this ordering is also zero. And that's the same for order eight. But now when we get to order nine, things change. We start before we add Aaron, we have bonds and crew, a bunt out and a fly out. Well, that doesn't produce a run. But now when we put a double in front of those, we produce a run. So Mar Aaron's marginal contribution in this order is one run. And when we do this calculation for all of the ordered permutations, we take the average of the marginal uh, contributions in the far right column. That is the Shapley value. In this context, I call that the Shapley run credit. Hank Aaron here receives one third of the credit for, the, for that single run that scores. Interesting, in this inning, Bonds and Crew also receive a third of credit, and DiMaggio receives zero credit. Why do Aaron, Bonds, and Crew receive the same credit here? Well, in this inning, their three contributions were each equally necessary for the run that scored. We might normally think that a double should count more. And in fact, if you look at a lot of different run scoring coalitions, a player who hits more doubles will be a part of more run scoring coalitions, and a player who hits fly outs will be a part of less. But in this particular inning, they each deserve credit. According to this fair calculation by the Shapley value, they each deserve equal credit for that single run that scores. So let me make some other observations. I've already mentioned how it reflects how necessary each contribution was to the run. It's also true that we have this efficiency property so that the number of runs scored is actually what is, will, will be the total of the credit allocated among the players. You can have a positive SRC without a runner in RBI. In this case, Bonds is sacrificed bunt, moved the runner over, and that was a key part of the run scoring, so he received credit. What about a home run hitter? A home run hitter will receive the full credit for his own run in RBI that he scored himself, but he'll split the credit for the other RBI he gets in, in that home run. So in this second inning, Barry Bonds hits a three-run homer, scoring Edmonds and Aaron, Edmonds and Aaron will each get half a credit for their own score. Bonds will get a half a credit for each of those scores, plus his own full credit of run, one run for scoring himself. So he'll have a two, two SRC for that three run homer. In the, in the third inning, we have a, another interesting case. We can actually have negative SRC. So if you look at this inning, no runs actually scored, but if you remove Fox from the lineup, you actually would have a single, a walk, a single and a single, which, would, which ought to score at least one run, four runners reaching base safely in a row. But if you put Fox uh, in his place in the, in the batting lineup, he grounds on a double play, preventing that run from scoring. So the Shapley value will actually give him blame for preventing a run from scoring. So even though that run, there was no run that scored in reality in that inning, then the, and as such, the player's uh, uh, SRC still summed to zero, uh, there is an allocation of credit that can be positive or negative in that in that inning. You can take this uh, uh, number and you, the the SRC and you can sum it across games, series, seasons, and careers. So it's very easily aggregated up. To calculate the SRC, there's two basic steps. The first, the the second step is very trivial. You just take an average of the marginal contributions. 
The first step, however, is not. So the, all this information in the red uh, uh, rectangle, this comprises the information in what in coalitional game theory we call the characteristic form of the game. It contains the information about what each sub-coalition of the players would have hypothetically been able to do on its own. And calculating this information is very non-trivial and computationally intense. So what I, I, what I have to do is write a computer program that simulates every inning for every possible sub-coalition of the teammates in that inning. And not only does it does the simulation have to go through, uh, to make the simulation work, I have to uh, code into the program all sorts of human judgments about what a play event that happened in one base out state would cause to change a different base out state and another base out state and all the possible base out states. Kind of like how a scorekeeper at the end of an inning decides which runs are earned runs and which runs are not, and it requires some human judgment and there's some rules of thumb, I have to code that manually into, into the computer program. And this takes, a, it's very time intensive because it, re, it requires the, the manual coding of a lot of human judgments. So I have a, a, a technical paper in which I describe this that, um, that should be hopefully coming out soon. So I won't say more about the technical side of that. So how can we compare SRC with other stats? Well, compared to traditional credit stats, uh, SRC is different in that it's an all-encompassing offensive measure and incorporates all the contributions, offensive contributions into one single metric. It includes knocking in other players, advancing runners, advancing yourself with a stolen base, uh, scoring a run, getting, getting on base and being scored. Comparing SRC uh, for teammates is useful, uh, particularly within a game or a series. Of course, comparing across eras, you have to account for um, things like run scoring environments. So because it's a context specific statistic by design, you have to be aware of the context when you use it. It actually has an interesting empirical relationship with, a, with an old, uh, an old uh, st uh, statistic in, in sabermetrics called runs participated in. The standard version of this is that the runs participated in is equal to the runs you score plus the RBI minus the home runs you hit. With a little algebraic manipulation, essentially you get a full credit of one for every home run, a full credit of, of, of one for every run in which you're batted in by someone else, and a full credit of one every time you bat someone else in. But as you could probably tell from just a few slides ago, my calculation would say this is not a very accurate weighting of credit. And so you can actually have a, through a simple algebraic de uh, derivation, you can derive, and making some heroic assumptions, you can come up with a different uh, weighted RPI, which actually is a pretty nice shadow statistic for SRC over the course of several games, which gives half a credit for every run you score where you're knocked in by someone else and half a credit for every time you knock in someone else uh, scoring. You can do better by, uh, I can estimate some coefficients that are a little bit more accurate uh, for some, for, some, uh, for uh, matching and correlating better with SRC. But overall, you can do a weighted version of RPI, which um, which does fairly well in giving you a sense of what a uh, player's SRC over the course of many games would look like. Of course, in a given game, it might not do well because uh, runs and RBIs and home runs don't capture things like advancing runners or stealing bases for yourself. Um, it's very, very different than skill statistics, very different from run estimators. All of those are, are attempting to remove the player from context, whereas SRC is context and teammate dependent by design, it's trying to account for credit within the coalitional context of run scoring. Now here's the second measure. The second measure is offensive Shapley win credits. Now, whereas for Shapley run credits, I simulate an inning and, and uh, all the possible things that could happen in that inning for all the sub coalitions. For Shapley win credits, I simulate an entire game for each sub coalition of the players. And if that sub coalition is able to outscore the other team, given the, other, the number of runs the other, score, the other team scores, then uh, that co sub-coalition has a win value of one, otherwise it's a win value of zero. So this is a win credit where the team is splitting for each win they record the credit for that win. So some observations about uh, this measure. So first it's gonna be correlated with the total uh, SRC that a player has uh, in a game. So in this table, the second column 
contains the game SRC for those three innings that uh, in the example I showed earlier, where Barry Bonds clearly has the most, and then Hank Aaron has the second most, and so on. Well, if you notice uh, on the far right, um, in a in a four three victory in which the team barely outscores the other team, every single run that was scored in that game was necessary and important for victory. And so any player who had a positive contribution to the run scoring is going to be an important, is going to have an important role in that win. And in this example, they're each going to deserve equal credit uh, for the victory. Um, so DiMaggio and Fox get no credit, but everyone else gets uh, some credit for the victory. What will happen as the margin of victory changes is that the win credit will concentrate differently. So in a two run victory, Bonds and Aaron, who were the largest run contributors, get the most credit. Carew and Edmonds lose some credit, although they still get some. In a three-run victory, Bonds gets a lot. Aaron and Edmonds now get far less. Carew, his run, now was not even necessary for the victory to happen, and so he doesn't receive any credit, according to the Shapley value. And now in a four-to-nothing uh, shutout victory, Barry Bonds gets the full credit for the victory. Why is that? In all of the innings, he was a necessary player in the run scoring coalitions that actually occurred. And by virtue of his home run alone, he could win the game by, not, by scoring himself. And therefore, the fair allocation for Barry Bonds in that inning is, or in that game is to receive the full win credit. Uh, the sum of the players in that game will, will sum to one. Uh, some of the OSWC will always sum to one. So we abide this efficiency criterion. And we can also sum over um, series and seasons and, and careers. The OSWC, we have various comparisons. We can compare with war. War has a bottom-up construction and comparison with replacement level player, whereas OSWC is calculated at the game level. Um, comparisons across time can be meaningful because it's within this uh, win credit uh, format. So win in one season to win another season, and credit for that is, is still meaningful. So that's a little bit better for a comparison over time. It's also very different from win probability added and variations of win probability added. Win probability added is the change in the probability of winning, where that probability, uh, that change in probability is an estimate over lots of different averages. It's not a change in actually winning. And so as such, late innings are going to count more, and the credit is going to be allocated unequally, uh, unequally between different players and run scoring coalitions. So a batter that gets on base with a double and then a player that scores that batter with another double, well, the one with the RBI will get more credit with win probability added. And the Shapley value would say, well, that's not a fair way of doing it. So um, my, my measure is based on actual wins. The early and late runs matter equally, and both, both kinds of contributions to run, scores are, run scoring are valued. It's also different than win shares. Win shares takes the share of, uh, takes the team's total uh, season wins and then splits the credit for those wins using skill measures. So my measure, again, it uh, assigns credit one win at a time. So it's constructed the level of the, the actual win. So and I would argue it's a better way of thinking about credit for wins. So here's my application. Um, so I, I looked at um, playoff series, uh, World Series, ALCS, and NLCS series uh, for the last 30 years, 1990 to 2018. I calculated the SRC and the OSWC for all the players using play-by-play -play data from RetroSheet, and I identified who was the, for the series, who led the series uh, for the, of the team that won the series, who led the series for SRC and OSWC, and if a, a single player led in both categories, I denote them the Shapley MVP. And of those, uh, of those playoff series, there were 86 MVPs awarded, of which 50 were not pitchers. So I'm going to focus on these 50 because I don't have a measure of defense. Uh, I'm just going to assume those pitchers awards was fine. Let's focus on the, the non-pitchers that were awarded, assuming that their offensive contributions were a big part of their selection as MVPs. And if you look on the pie chart on the right, we see that over a third of the non-pitcher MVPs actually who actually won, they were also Shapley MVPs. And roughly about a third, uh, so that's the orange, and roughly about a third in the yellow, they were not Shapley MVPs, but they were the, the SRC leader. And then about 8% were not Shapley MVPs, but they did lead in, in, Sha in Shapley win credits. And then about a quarter do not have any claim for being the, the best offensive contributor uh, in the series. 
And so we see right off the bat that these metrics that I've created, they capture a portion of the voters' preferences, but there's clearly a bias in the voters' preferences towards run contributions rather than win contributions. So if you want to see some names, here's a, here's a table of uh, World Series MVPs from 1990 to 2018. So there's too much on there, so let me highlight a few things. So what I've highlighted in the green are the World Series MVPs who were also the Shapley MVP. So they, these uh, MVPs were unambiguously, according to my measures, the best and most valuable offensive contributors uh, in the series. Now, these new highlighted ones are the players who won the MVP, but they did not lead in, in either of these offensive categories. So in 2016, Zobrist won the MVP, but Rizzo had much higher, uh, deserved much more credit for the runs that scored, and Russell deserved much uh, more credit for the wins. In 2015, Perez was the MB received the MVP award, but Lorenzen Kane was uh, the Shapley MVP, had much higher uh, run credits and much higher win credits. Of course, Perez was the catcher, and that's an important defensive contribution, and that was something acknowledged uh, by the uh, uh, when people described why he won. So it's harder for me to comment on that on that um, MVP selection. But let's look at 2004. Manny Ramirez, an outfielder, compared with Johnny Damon, an outfielder. They have nearly identical SRC, but Johnny Damon has much higher win credit. So what happened in that? Let's look closer. So in this series, Boston beat St. Louis in a four-game sweep. By traditional metrics, Manny Ramirez and Johnny Damon, they look identical. They both hit one home run. They both uh, have uh, two, uh, Manny Ramirez has two runs, four RBI. Damon has four runs, two RBI. By, by run participated in, it, they're identical. In the first two games, they actually received identical Shapley win credits for their offensive contributions. In the third game, Manny Ramirez received more. He hit a home run, he had a, an RBI scoring hit. Johnny Damon scored a run, so he, he helped, uh, but, uh, but, but Manny Ramirez received more. Now this fourth game is where we see a big difference in their win credit, enough so that Johnny Damon has a much higher win credit for the whole series. In that fourth game, Johnny Damon hit a home run at the start of the game, and as a shutout, that was enough to seal the victory. So he receives a huge, or almost enough to seal the victory. He received a lot of, uh, 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 he wins, receives a lot of win credits for his contribution there. So why did Manny Ramirez win the MVP? Well, if you look at their win probability added, you see that Manny Ramirez has a much higher win probability added, and a lot of that is due to that game three. Well, in game three, Manny Ramirez hit that home run, and he also had that RBI hit later in the game. Well, those, the RBI hit later in the game is going to get him a lot of win probability added, uh, and Johnny Damon doesn't receive, for that game, he, he doesn't even receive a positive win probability added. Um, and so the win probability added is going to re reflect a different kind of way of thinking about their contributions, potentially something that the voters pay attention more. We like clutch hits. We credit those a lot um, when we think about our um, batters. Um, but oddly enough, <laughs> in that inning, uh, who did, who did uh, Manny Ramirez score with his clutch hit? He scored Johnny Damon who, uh, in game three. So the my measure, the offensive Shapley win credit, is going to give Johnny Damon a lot more credit for getting on base and being scored and not give Manny Ramirez as much credit as a win probability added will. So what do we take away from this, this one simple application? Well, obviously, MVP voters consider defense and pitching as they should, and my, measure can't, my measures can't uh, comment on that. Um, MVP, MVP voters consider runs more than wins, probably because run contribution measures are readily available or, uh, uh, and easier uh, for people to, to obtain. They also consider things like win probability added, and that makes sense. They care about the emotion of the game. But my measures say that these are not capturing the full and, and a fair uh, allocation of credit uh, in, in, uh, in playoff series. And so if we look for the players who, who had more than 0.1 uh, win credit than the, the player who received the MVP, then these would be potential candidates, uh, good candidates to, to have received the, the MVP. Um, and so these are the potential MVP snubs uh, in, uh, in the last 30 years for World Series, ALCS, and, and NLCS. And you can see Johnny Damon listed this as one of those. So what's the conclusion? So my, uh, my work has created two new measures of offensive credit. 
Uh, it has a, a strong theoretical foundation that explicitly accounts for the coalitional nature of scoring and winning. It's not a measure of skill, it's a measure of credit, it's about accounting. Like war, it's computationally non-trivial, but very easy to use. I would argue it's the best single holistic measure of offensive credit. I could see it be included in a box score as a way to encapsulate what a player did in contributing to, uh, to a team. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. I would call what I've done version 1.0. Um, a version 2.0 could, could be made that improves on, on the coding of these human judgments that go into the creation of the, um, the uh, characteristic form of the game and then go into the calculations of the marginal contributions. I haven't done regular seasons yet. I've just focused on the postseason. Obviously, I would love to apply the Shapley value to defense and pitching. So I have ideas on that, haven't done it yet. And the ultimate goal is to create an overall offensive plus defensive uh, measure of an overall Shapley win credit um, measure to, to, to capture all facets of the game. So I'm thank, thanks for uh, listening. And if you've got any questions, um, you can certainly reach out to me. There's my email right there. Thank you.